All right. Good afternoon. First of all, I really appreciate you guys showing up here, especially being a lunch hour slot. Um, it's definitely one of the tougher spots to be in. I'm Imad Benjamin. I'm a principal architect with VMware. Alongside of me, Alessandro. My name is Alessandro Corniali Lindsley. I'm a senior architect for Societe Generale. And today we're going to talk to you about trading platforms. Okay? Now, there are certain biases as to which languages are used in trading platforms, obviously Java and others. But uh, we, will, we will give you a whole range of best practices that uh, you ought to, ought to have handy uh, when you're looking at these type of systems. All right, with that, let's get started. So we're going to have an overview section. We want to kind of detail out the technical nuts and bolts of, of trading platforms from a technical perspective. And then Alessandro will come in, we'll cover uh, the functional perspective, you know, what trading platforms actually do, and then some of the other technical aspects uh, in terms of gotchas when you're dealing with like an in-memory database that has its own HA mechanism coupled with, you know, VMware that has its own HA mechanism. How do you marry the two together and so on? It gets pretty interesting. And then we'll summarize and leave plenty of time for questions. I'm one of those speakers, and Alessandro is the same. You can interrupt us any time. Ask any questions related to this topic. You can't ask me questions that's not related. Just kidding. You want to say a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Alessandro Corniali Lindsley. I'm an architect with uh, Societe Generale, which is a large uh, bank uh, with retail and uh, corporate and financial services, and uh, I work in the corporate and financial services uh, arm. I've been, I come from an engineering background with Windows, although nothing that I'm going to talk about today has anything to do with that. Uh, and yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I started out as a, a software engineer, um, C++, Java. I wrote code for trading platforms, um, wrote business applications. Um, and then right around 2005, uh, I bumped into this company called VMware. Um, and uh, I was brought in to fix a scalability issue. I worked on fixing the code and fixing the un platform underneath. And as a developer, like any, many developers, I tended to ignore anything below the OS. Well, it was very enriching for me to actually go further down and learn a lot more that's very beneficial. Uh, so I speak at developer conferences. Uh, coaching them on infrastructure, and I speak at infrastructure con conferences, coaching on development aspects and app aspects. All right? Uh, and, uh, you know, these days I mostly focus on helping our customers with scalability issues. I see some of my customers that I recognize in the audience. All right. So I want to uh, kind of define a context for a lot of this content and for what I see happening in the future. Now, this is a session I did at Spring One last year, and I've done it at ArcConf, which is a developer conference. You can go to the full explanation of what platform engineering is at my blog, vmjava.com. I go into detail about it. I don't want to kind of take up the, the golden 60 minutes that we have here all to do with that. But essentially, platform engineering is application runtime knowledge coupled with infrastructure knowledge. The problem that we have today is that developers don't actually have the application runtime knowledge. Now, what is an example of application runtime? The Java virtual machine is an application runtime. You have the Java code that lives inside the Java virtual machine, which is the application runtime, and then you have the infrastructure compute space that it runs on. The runtime stuff is what's completely broken. Um, so, <clears throat> so why is it, and, and I believe it or not, I get challenged quite a bit about this, is why is it that it's still about Java? Like, is it just because I'm in love with it? Or is there an underlying reason? Well, uh, let, let's, look at, let's look at it, why it's still about Java. Java has not reached its scalability limit. It's a 64-bit application runtime kernel it can address 16 exabytes of memory. Now, there's not a single system 
and the Milky Way galaxy, or let alone on Earth, that can give you that type of sing single contiguous memory space. The next limit that you're dealing with is the OS limits, right? And then the hypervisor limits. And the more practical limits are the physical limits, you know, like what can you get on a server? And then, obviously, the NUMA boundary. That's the real limit, right, that you're dealing with. Because, you know, we size to the NUMA node. Uh, those of you that have been to my sessions before, I, I go into NUMA quite a bit. We'll touch on it today. But obviously, I wanted to give you a range of best practices rather than just focus on one specific one too deeply. So how big is your NUMA node? Uh, you know, I have a saying. You know, how big is your NUMA node is, is what's important in terms of performance. I have a saying is one VM, one JVM within a NUMA node, leave no core behind, take up the entire memory, right? And I'll show you how to do that, okay? And that's size for performance, right? Obviously, if you have web apps or application tenancy issues and you want to slice up more VMs, then you could do that as well. And we'll get into that in a minute. So Java continues to live on because it can vertically scale really well. Now, the largest JVM that I've dealt with as a single JVM is a monitoring system for um, a certain video streaming company. Uh, that's about a 360 gig JVM size because the monitoring system does not scale out in this particular instance. So Java has no problem with scale. Knowing that it scales up is important because we have a lot of fragmentation issues, scale out, horizontal scale out fragmentation issues in the industry right now in terms of like, you see Java systems that are 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, even 10,000 JVMs, all one gig. That's crazy. Right? There has to be a lower scale, scale up that, that, we can, uh, that we can provide. Now, let's look at other perspective. Most of you probably don't know that under the covers, some of these are obvious, but some of them are not so obvious, that Java is under the covers in these products. So you'll notice Java developers will talk about Java app servers or uh, serverless containers or application servers and so on. So you got IBM WebSphere, Oracle Fusion, WebLogic Middleware, JBoss, Tomcat, and so on, right? They're all Java systems. And then look at an in-memory database uh, space. That's a pretty busy space. Uh, I want to say top five, six, seven in-memory databases I've pretty comfortably virtualized. And I would say in-memory database virtualization is mainstream. Gone the years when it wasn't, like three, four years ago. Now it's mainstream. Certainly in the case of New Age or Society General, we're talking about, what, one terabyte, approximately, mm -hmm. in-memory database? OK. We do have other customers with one terabyte plus. And within that space, you've got a bunch of others uh, that are you know, pure Java-based. Some of them are you know, uh, made up of several languages, which makes scalability a little bit harder. Um, and then you've got Mongo, which is C++ system, and then obviously Couchbase is Erlang. I won't have time to go into the nonsense of you know, the different languages, but uh, they're important for scalability. And then Hadoop. Hadoop is a Java system. Happens to be dealing with a lot of big data. So all of your Java best practices, all of the stuff that I've written about is all applicable to Hadoop. Right now I'm dealing with uh, a Yarn scalability. Yarn is a resource scheduler for uh, Hadoop systems. Um, you know, trying to tune Yarn to work better on vSphere. So, and then uh, search engines. These are leading search engines that your developers may be deploying on your infrastructure and you don't know about it. It's a Java system. You need to have a Java conversation with, uh, with your developers. And a slew of others, right? Obviously, some build system, Jenkins, and then messaging systems. Obviously, Tipco is a mix. You know, it has C, C++, and Java. Predominantly, a lot of stuff is still Java. Then RabbitMQ is Erlang. It's not Java. And MQ series is a mix. Uh, but all of these things are used in trading platforms. You cannot pick up a single trading platform that is not made up of these products. Obviously, not every single one, but, you know, kind of a uh, cherry-picked out of each category. 
reason why I put this slide up is, uh, is, is that I, you know, I discovered early on in dealing with our customers is that this picture helps them to identify those applications related to certain computer languages. And then that drives what you do and how you size and how you chip. So that's on the products that you use and so on. But what about our stack, our management stack? vCenter is a big Java app. All right? And uh, I'm not going to get into tuning vCenter, but you know you can actually double click and see what I've done with those config files. This, this is a is it five, I think vCenter five. Might have been five five. I don't remember, but it's not six. Um, and I've done some tuning to get vCenter to actually scale quite a bit. Some of the scalability numbers are very interesting. Unsupported, only for geeking out. But you know, and I'm not going to quote you on the scalability numbers, but they were very impressive. And you can fix a lot of the you know kind of quick UI sluggishness issues with with the quick, tweak, quick tweaks there. Uh, VROPS is a Java app. It's a wrapper around Gemfire, which is an in-memory database. Uh, in 6162 version of VROPS, these are the configs. They're my configs. Uh, I've actually tuned them. And you'll find that some of this tuning that we've applied, uh, New Edge has actually used on their own product. So again, this is an example that proves that the knowledge that you use on a customer application equally applies to a product as well, because the common denominator is, in both cases, Gemfire, which, again, is a Java system. Big sale pitch for Java here today. All right, so uh, rule number one. And kind of categorize number of rules to keep in mind Anytime you hear a Java system, right, or an app that's made of Java. Rule number one is understand the sizing. It's completely misunderstood. Don't rely on your Java developers to, to believe, you know, the number that they're telling you about the heap space is correct. Uh, so let's look at a, a, a virtual machine. Now, it has a need for some operating system memory and a Java process, right? So this is the Java process, the brown box. Now, inside the Java process, there's a section called the heap. Now, there's a flag called minus XMX. That's the heap size, the max heap size. There's also a flag called minus XMS. That's the initial heap. Always set the initial heap equal to the max heap, please. I won't even go into explaining why not, OK? We could follow up later. But just do it for performance sake um, and so on. Because if you don't, you'll end up having to repage the initial to meet the demand, which causes garbage collection, which causes CPU contention, and so on. So let's avoid that. Uh, outside of the heap, but still within the Java process, you have what's called the stack. The default stack on Java on Linux is 256K. If you're adventurous and you run Java on Windows, the default stack is 1 meg, right? Uh, it's outside of the heap, but still within the Java process. It actually grabs native memory. By native, I mean, you know, OS memory, right? It's, if it's on purely physical, it's native. But if it's on virtual, it's not really native memory, right? It's mapped memory. Anyway. Uh, and so, and then there's the other mem section. Now, the other mem section has got the internal compiler information, socket communication, some products, like in-memory database products, will bypass the heap and allocate a lot of memory outside of the heap, but still within the Java process. This is why, if you're going to just rely on the heap, you'll always get it wrong. You'll get it wrong by 20%, 30%. You should actually measure it, measure it when the Java process is at peak and it's running, and you do top or whatever monitoring system you're using to measure how much it's, it's using, in actual fact, because of the space. Uh, let me see. Yeah, because you have the heap and off the heap section. Okay? Developers cannot tell you about off the heap section. They don't know how to measure it. They can tell you about the heap because they've taken a good guess at it. Right? Which is like that. So, um, so measure that. Now, typically, typically what I say is, and I think that's the next slide, typically what I say is, 
if the heap is x, your total memory requirement for the Java process is about 1.2, 1.25 x plus whatever the OS is. Like, typically, one gig for the OS is more than enough. But then, you know, it just depends what, you, what else you're doing on the OS. You might have some security agent. You might have other stuff. That's kind of hard to measure. You, you would know that. So a lot of systems are sized. If they're perfect systems, they're about 30% wrong from a memory perspective, because of, just, just because of that. Just because the heap and off the heap section. Many people don't know about the off the heap section. Rule number two, Java systems are multi-tier. Don't go tweaking one tier thinking that'll fix the problem. And don't, don't even believe a developer that tells you that, right? Oh, we fixed it. It was some GC garbage collection flag. We just did it, and everything is fine. As soon as you touch one tier, you've just shifted the problem to the next tier, OK? Java systems are multi-tier. You have the load balancer tier. You have the web server tier, right? with Apache or whatever. Then you have the JVMs, the application server tier, and then you have databases. In between, you may have in-memory databases. What is the impact of a change in one tier across all of the other tiers? Remember, I told you about platform engineering? As a platform engineer, whether this is Java or not, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, there are pl plenty systems like search systems that are in C++, and I apply the same logic to. I look at the load balancer. And I say, OK, well, you know, the load balance has taken in 1,000 hits. Of those 1,000 hits, 500 will go to the Apache, the web server tier. And as a result, I'll have to do a calculation as to how many Apache processes I need. What is the r application runtime container calculation to handle 500 requests? Who's done that math? You will find nobody's done that math because your Apache got installed by the Linux admin, who was a part-time Apache guy, and it was just a guess, right? That's fine. When you don't know, you guess, right? So uh, the other thing is, the rest of that traffic might have been 500, uh, additional 500 requests. They're not static requests. They're dynamic, what we call dynamic requests. Those will actually hit your Java applications. So now you've got 500 threads being requested from your system. Now, 500 threads, right? I've got potentially just two here. I mean, in the diagram, is four. But let's just, for example's sake, let's just say there are two. Well, I need to make sure each Java container has capacity of 250 threads. Who actually looks into that? Who double checks that? So if you have a developer who says, oh, you know what? We didn't have enough threads. I just changed this to 1,000 threads. What is the impact of that? You can't just do that. Well, a 1,000 threads here is going to go request a bunch of extra database connections. So have you told the DBA that have you actually done that? If you were a platform engineer, you'd be asking all those multi-tier questions. You know, A change in one tier, what did it do to the next tier? If you don't ask those questions, the responsibility is on you because guess what? You've just let developers blame you for the next failure. You just let them get away with it. So part of, part of what I do is like getting you to the set of questions that you need to ask. And in today's session, I think we have about nine or 10 rules of, of the set of questions you should go through on every design, on every app. Obviously, ideally, it's not going to happen always. But if you can do it on at least one critical application, then you're on your way to bridging the gap. Uh, and then understanding platform categories. Now, in in-memory databases, and we'll get into that in a minute, I always say you have to have one JVM per VM. Okay. Now, that rule does not make any sense for web apps. You can't afford to do that. You, you eventually will have to stack up more JVMs because you have thousands of web apps that cannot be intermixed. And you have to provide a JVM instance to. So it turns out there's a thing called category one. 80% of what you guys do in terms of the workloads that you deploy are web apps. They fit into, fit into this category, category one. And category one tends to be more CPU bound than anything else. 
Um, so, so let's take a look at this server as a, as a two-socket server. It's got 16 total cores on it, you know, eight cores per socket, ignoring hyper threading for a minute. And it's got about 256 uh, gig worth of RAM. And I say, you know what, just make JVMs of four gig each, right? Do the math at the, you know, 1.25x, so it's four and a half gig, and, you know, five gig, whatever, for the OS and so on. So it ends up being about 57 JVMs deployed and I'm ignoring VMs for a minute, right? Whether it's 57 VMs or half that number of VMs, it doesn't really matter. Let's just say it's 57 JVMs. Could be on one VM, could be on two VMs. 57 JVMs running on that system. What is the contention here? Anyone want to have a go at it? What's going to be the problem? What's going to be the bottleneck? CPU, thank you very much. If you can ignore everything I tell you from now on and you can just ask that question, I'd be very happy camper. You just like show to your Java developers that deploying 80 and 120 JVMs across a single ESXi host may have some CPU contention issues. Now if they come back and tell you, well CPU is fine, then you know those 120 or 80 JVMs that are deployed on ESXi hosts are not tier one, are not tier two, they're tier hello world. You know, they need to go consolidate them. They need, I mean, they're wasting your time. They're wasting a lot of dollars. But anyway, that's a deeper conversation. So then you get into, like, you might be asking this question during design time. And you say, well, you know, maybe the, the two-socket configuration for web apps is not great for us because we need more cores than, than memory. Almost always these ESXi servers, these server class machines that you get these days, their size is if you're going to run a database on them. They've got a ton of memory. And you know, that many, a dozen or so CPUs, right? Well, maybe you want to swap out that amount of memory for more CPUs. So you go and get a four socket server instead of a two socket server. It could be that a four socket server is more appropriate for your web app farms. And if you can afford to do that. All right, category two in memory databases and messaging systems. Now, in category one, we had a tenancy issue, right? Because we have a lot of different unique apps, and they all need their own life cycle. Life cycle means their own JVM, their own VM, all that sort of stuff, right? But in in-memory databases, it's really one tenant. It's just one database. It happens to be in memory. It's one app. So what we want to do in that case is limit the number of JVMs that there are, half a dozen or so, and make the JVMs as big as possible that occupy the entire NUMA node, okay? Anytime you don't want to do that, that means you don't care about performance as much. But if you want the biggest bang for the buck, as you can see here, is a two socket server, two VMs, two JVMs, one JVM per VM. In this case, uh, I think this is an eight core, eight vCPU, ignoring prefer HT or hyper threading. Otherwise, if you want to fully saturate, you go to 16 vCPU per socket. Um, and size the JV, so you would size the VM, we'll get into an actual equation in a minute. But you size the VM to about 85, 90% of the available memory, 85% more conservative. And then of that 85%, you multiply that by about 80%, 80% of 85%, right? Which is about 64%, is that right? Something like that. That's your heap size for the J JVM. And by the way, you can go to vmjava.com. I've got actual examples that I'll walk through this. So for in-memory databases, I almost always want to use two-socket systems, OK? You can use four-socket systems. It just means now you have to go and deploy more in-memory database instances on the same ESXi host. Well, what if the ESXi host goes down? Well, yeah, maybe it's got redundancy. But then you've got four VMs there that potentially hold one terabyte of data, right, uh, that, that you have to go deal with. You're losing one terabyte of data, right? Ooh. All right, let's keep going. All right. Understanding building block. It's pretty important to build building block. Now, if two apps happen to live on the same OS, test them that way. Certify them that way. Get yourself a template that matches up against the building block. And any time you scale up, 
scale out by the same amount of compute space allocated to that building block. Meaning if it's a two vCPU VM with five gig allocated to it, every time you scale out, do the same thing. Because you want to keep the load balancer traffic equally distributed across all of the VMs. You don't want to skew uh, any of the distribution. Now, one of the biggest problems I find is people will change. Let's say you have a performance issue with, with a VM, and they go from two vCPU to four vCPU. But they don't change the Java process to tell it, you know what, you can actually double up on the number of threads that you can gobble up now. Because otherwise, how is Java going to take benefit or reap in benefits from the additional vCPUs? It doesn't know how to do that. You've got to tell it. Same thing with memory. If you double up the amount of memory, you go from 5 to 10 gig, how have you adjusted the Java heap space to take up the additional memory? If you haven't done that, you could keep increasing memory and compute space or CPU on the VM all day, and if you don't touch Java, you will see no performance benefit. All right, so big VMs and big JVMs are real. Don't be afraid of them. Uh, again, go to vmjava.com. I've got plenty of examples there. Uh, but don't ignore NUMA. All right, now speaking of NUMA, uh, I used to have a much more refined 1% based overhead formula. These days, I make it much easier for everybody. Uh, I, I just say 15%, never encroach, never size more than 85% of the available memory on the ESXi host. If you want to get fancy, maybe that number is about 94%, maybe 95%. But 85% works always. It's very conservative. And if you've got AMD, that number is 2x because of the stack NUMA nodes. Now, so you guys got that, right? It's the total memory on the host multiplied by 0 0.85 because I want to leave 15% as, uh, as safety net. And then I divide it by number of sockets. So if it's a two socket server, that number is two, four, and so on. And with AMD, it's 2x that. So if I have a two socket AMD, I got to divide by four because of the stack NUMA node. All right. So actually, Intel chips are starting to look more, I don't want to say like AMD chips, but they have this notion of COD, right? It's not cache on delivery when you deliver an ASXi host. It's cluster on die, OK? And you should enable cluster on die. Uh, who knows what cluster on die is here? Awesome. Uh, so basically, they split the cluster to kind of a, a stack NUMA node. So they do the same thing on the other socket. Now, the interleaving is not really interleaving between the, the clusters that are on a single die, but it's still slower, right? And then, obviously, the interleaving in between the sockets for Java apps, you know, if you size something that doesn't fit in with the NUMA node, you're going to drop by 30% in terms of performance and 50% in terms of performance for databases. All right, so keep in mind, Haswell chips always enable cluster on die, OK? And then if it's a two-socket server, you do my calculation, you have to divide not by two sockets, by four. Multiply one terabyte by 0 0.85 divided by four for Haswell chips, two-socket systems. All right, I'm running a little bit behind here. OK, don't let anyone fool you to say that scale-out is the only solution and it's the most feasible solution. It's not. And uh, so I did this experiment. I took two JVMs of two gig each versus four JVMs of one gig each and put them up against each other. And the two JVM case, the scenario two, beat the four JVMs by about 26% better response time. But here's the real important information. Scenario two conducted the same amount of workload for 60% less CPU. And so if you have Java apps there, and there's like 10,000 of them, 10,000 JVMs, if it's the same app, you should be asking whether you should be consolidating those JVMs into a few JVMs of a, a little bit larger heap, right? So be on the lookout for that. And this is the proof why that is. Because a JVM can vertically scale. Remember I started in the conversation about you know, the scalability of JVM has not been reached? This is a small proof of it where and we have larger proofs internally, uh, where you know you continue to increase the heap, the CPU does not proportionally increase either, because otherwise the JVM would not be scalable. And we need to take advantage of that, because it's cheaper.
get rid of monitoring, additional monitoring, additional systems that we don't need to manage, and so on. This is golden. It saved a lot of money for people. Uh, the other thing is avoid mixing workloads. If you've got a bad job and a web app deployed on the same JVM, you're just waiting for trouble to happen because when that super duper report runs, your web app just going to come to a screeching halt. Okay? So separate them out. So instead of doing this, right, do this. So web apps on their own and job schedulers or you know, more uh, specialized types of workloads on their own. All right. Uh, 4GB is the new GB uh, because 4 gig is 2 to 32 natural. Uh, Java treats it like 32 even though it runs inside the 64-bit JVM. So if your Java developers fear very large heap spaces, 4 gig is no longer really that big, okay? Because imagine if you have 1,000 JVMs of 1 gig each, you can run that entire system with 250 JVMs of 4 gig each, and you will save 75% of all of the monitoring, you'll get rid of a ton of CPU, you will improve your performance, and so on. All right. I'm almost done. So let me just say one more thing, and I'll hand over to Alessandro. I'm like five minutes behind. So uh, the reason why 4 gig is the new gig, let me just explain that. When you go from 32-bit to 64-bit JVM, the pointer doubles in size, which means if you take an app that used to run under 1 gig and 32-bit, you deploy it in 64-bit, it's going to need maybe 2 gig worth of memory. Uh, JVM vendors knew about this, so they provided compression, right? They compress the 64-bit operand down to 32-bit, even though you're running inside the 64-bit JVM kernel. That compression is automatic for anything up to 4 gig heap space, it, because it's natural to the 32. That's why, might as well take advantage of it. That's why it's the new 1 gig. All right, let me just skip over that, and I'll hand over to Alessandro. All right. I just uh, skip over this. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Here you go, Alessandro. Thank you. Uh, uh, are there any quick questions that we're going to deal with right now, or you want to do it at the end? Any quick questions? All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. So uh, taking all of these uh, the things that Imad has been talking about and then uh, working it into the practical needs of a platform, that's uh, what this is. Uh, my segment here is about, uh, as I said before, I uh, work in a corporate and investment arm of Societe Generale. And uh, the specific platform that we've used, that we uh, have applied these techniques in, uh, is uh, called Envision. It's a pre- and post-trading platform. It handles all the trades that come in off the exchanges, uh, pulls them into an in-memory database, normalizes them, and uh, uh, performs transformations on that data, and then allows uh, downstream applications to access that information. And it was a really necessary uh, application for us to develop. Uh, it replaced 10 other systems that we had that were much uh, less efficient at, at performing that, that job. So uh, this system provides uh, a handles input from 63 exchanges and 20 clearinghouses, uh, does t handles 20 million trades a day. Just reading over these things, it, it does it quickly. It handles a, a lot of orchestration services. It does a lot within the system uh, for the application, downstream applications. Uh, it does that 24 hours a day, six days a week. And uh, STP is a, a straight through processing. It's a, a measure of how many transactions go through uh, where you don't have to interact with them. There's no human interaction. So obviously, the higher number, the more automation, the, the more things are being handled in, in an automated fashion. So uh, that's, a, that's a good, good ratio. And because of the way the system is designed, uh, we can add new clients in, add new markets in really easily. So this is uh, what we term a tier zero application. It's as important to our business as DNS, Active Directory, ESX infrastructure. Uh, the components that we use, obviously the uh, uh, Gemfire in-memory databases is, is a key piece of this. We have 
Uh, within the application, we have two major uh, cache components that we use. Uh, the adapters, the pieces that feed information into and, and take it out of this, uh, this cache are based off of TC server uh, using custom Java. Uh, we use a RabbitMQ messaging backbone to hand information throughout the system. And uh, obviously, we built this on uh, with virtualization in mind. The reasons for doing that are abundantly obvious. Uh, and one of the great things about it is because it is a big system, by doing it in a virtual fashion, we open ourselves up to capabilities of automation for deployment management. Uh, and so we're, we're uh, spending a lot of time and energy in that realm. So to talk about some of the application components, uh, we've got the yellow boxes here uh, represent the, the TC servers. We've got, we call them adapters. They're read adapters and read write adapters and they provide, as I said, they, they uh, feed information into the, the caches and, and extract it and hand it off to applications. Uh, we've got these two, whoop, wrong button, whoa. Uh, we've got the purple uh, <laughs> uh, circle there is uh, uh, one of the Gemfire caches that we use um, to collect information and just hold it right off the, the exchanges. And that way we have a pristine copy of the original trade. And if anything happens downstream, we can go back to that original copy, read it in. Uh, saves time and effort under that circumstance. Then we've got a, another uh, larger cache, uh, which, uh, which is the main you know, focal point, the main uh, place where uh, we perform the transformations and, normal, and, uh, and hold the, uh, the information. Each of these grids has a bunch of subcomponents, uh, main nodes, uh, locators, which are uh, uh, gem fire components that are like traffic managers uh, and some other uh, things like that. And then, as I mentioned, we use RabbitMQ as our backbone. Uh, just to walk through a, a kind of a basic uh, information flow, we have an exchange. The exchanges. All the, these 63 exchanges, these clearinghouses, they provide information or they feed information in any number of different ways. IBM MQ, I mean, everything down to CSV files, the formats are all different. So we, we take the information, we set up an adapter to read the information off the exchange, pull it off the queue, or read it out of the CSV or whatever it is. And like I said, drop it first into the safe store so we have that copy. And then safe store feeds it into the MQ, and then we'll have an adapter that picks it up, normalizes the data, and drops it into the main cache. Uh, at that point, an application, uh, it'll send information to an application if that's uh, what's required. We can also occasionally transform the information uh, for a wider number of applications. So we'll have a, an adapter read it off the queue, do some sort of enrichment or, or modification to the data, drop it back into the data uh, into the database, and then maybe a, another application that'll that'll pick it up. And when all of this is put together, we toss a dashboard on top of it, which allows us to see what's going on uh, anywhere in the system. Um, these blue boxes are the adapters. The green ones over on the left hand are, are the safe store components. And you can kind of imagine that all the cables connecting it are, are uh, MQ paths. So when we take these, uh, these caches and structure them and handle the data transfer between them, replicate the data, we end up with a global cache. On North America, we've got a primary site, secondary site. The caches are uh, trading information back and forth, so they form one pool. Same thing happening in the UK. And then those two caches, uh, uh, talk to each other and, and uh, collect information. So in essence, we have a gigantic global database that we can pull information from, uh, for, depending on the application, which region, which exchange it needs to get information from. And that same structure allows us to do uh, a very, very, uh, very slick DR uh, strategy we have, uh, the MQ is handled by SAN replication. But again, Gemfire, its native configurations allow for this exchange this, uh, of, of uh, cache information. So we turn that on, so we've got duplicate copies in two data centers, uh, plus the other two in the, in the other region. Uh, the adapters themselves are stateless, so we don't really care about them. We have a copy of the adapter in our, in our uh, secondary site. And then we use this fact that the databases 
are synchronized so that we put the uh, dashboard to read off of our secondary site, so we're not adding that load to that uh, oversight load. So uh, if anything that happens to the primary site, it's all there. All we do is flick some DNS uh, entries around, and now everything is going through the secondary site. Uh, and we can be in this configuration where the applications are still at the primary site if it's some kind of failure with hardware or something that's, that's localized, or under worst case scenario, we'll take our feeds from the secondary site and just move it over. Physical architecture is based off, uh, in North America and the UK, we have slightly different uh, hardware, mostly just dependent on, on cost and, and uh, uh, the pipeline that we have. So in North America, we run on blades. We've been doing that for about five, six years. We have an InfiniBand uh, Oracle Fabric Interconnect system in the middle. Uh, that's the same stuff that uh, is underneath, that same technology is used in Exologic, uh, in, in Oracle's Exologic. So it's, uh, it's pretty nice, it's very fast. Um, and since we have more VMs in the system than just Envision, it's also good for, and those VMs run the applications. It also means that the, it's not quite east-west, but the traffic between those VMs is uh, very, very fast. So if you're going to consider Gemfire and how it manages its database, uh, manages memory, uh, you have to consider how your choices at that level interact with how you configure your ESX cluster so that you don't undermine the redundancies that you turn on in Gemfire. Uh, Gemfire is a very flexible system. It has a lot of different use cases. There are lots of flags, lots of different ways that you can skin a cat. So its most basic idea is a partition. Loosely speaking, a partition has data objects, uh, you know, a copy of each data object scattered across the nodes. Uh, problem there, of course, is if you lose a node, you're losing data. So what you do is you create an HA partition, which creates duplicate uh, objects for every single uh, data object, a primary and a secondary. But just out of the box, turned on, it doesn't guarantee that your nodes, that, that your uh, data objects are on a single node. Uh, so you can end up with the problem where uh, you lose a node and you lose both copies. So you turn, on, you turn on redundancy zones, that separates everything out so you can only have one copy of a data object on a given node. And now you've got something that can survive uh, the failure of a node. You've got, there are other technologies that you can use to replicate the entire uh, uh, partition to a, another set of nodes. This is how we're doing that global and primary site to secondary site uh, replication. Uh, but, and, and, and that's really good. That, that gets uh, your partitions protected. But uh, what happens if uh, you're not careful with where you put your VMs and you have two VMs on one ESX host and it fails. You've got a problem. So it's not rocket science. You use DRS uh, to, to, to manage how you're placing your, your, your VMs across your uh, cluster. So what we do is we have DRS enabled uh, full auto across our cluster. And then we use anti-affinity rules to separate our cache nodes or main data grid nodes across available ESX hosts, so they're never co-located. We do the same thing for the safe store cache for the same reason. Those locators, which are the traffic cops, same kind of problem. You don't want both of them failing, so we use anti-affinity rules there. We leave DRS partial so that if there's a failure for powering up systems, we're getting some information. We're not going to lock a VM to a specific ESX host. We still want some measure of flexibility. We just want to control it. And then we let those adapters, the rest of the systems, which are much smaller, uh, act like sand in the rocks. Uh, with this kind of design, we are able to put all of our, uh, and the sizing that we're dealing with, uh, we end up running all of our environments on the same cluster and then just control uh, the resource pool with resource pools. So back several slides. One application instance has between 38 to, 38 to 44 separate virtual machines. That is a lot of VMs by itself. But we have one application instance, its secondary applications instance, and its sister application instance instances in the UK. So that's four times 44. 
uh, and we, we can't handle one, we, we, we're not going to deploy one application instance at a time. We have to do them all at the same time. So this is a huge amount of work if you're dealing with an upgrade, uh, anything like that. So, so we've spent a lot of time, particularly this last year, in abstracting the application out and putting automation uh, and scripting in, in play. It's not, it's not full automation, not yet, but it's the first step in getting there. And that re required a lot of effort to, as I said, abstract out the application. None of these cache nodes are special snowflakes. None of these adapters are special snowflakes. We've described what they are, worked with the application developers, worked with our middleware uh, uh, um, assets to, to abstract out the application components so that we can define on a, on a line in, in a spreadsheet what each VM, what makes it unique and what makes it do the job that it needs to do. And then from that, if we need to deploy anything, we can, uh, we can read the VM configuration that we want in, through Power CLI over to a cluster. It'll create the VM, attach a, a custom ISO, boot it, and then kickstart and puppet uh, will configure, perform the OS configuration, uh, set groups, uh, anything that's special about that, that, uh, that particular node. And then we can add off to the middleware team and they can, uh, they'll run similar processes to deploy and configure the application, which is great. And then if we decide that we need to redeploy our entire QA environment, having changed a configuration in, uh, half a dozen of the adapters and we want to have Gemfire Rev and we want to be uh, resized. We run the whole matrix in and deploy all the systems that we need in about 24 hours. We can do that 24 hours to make sure that we do double checks and run extra validations and fix little things that invariably fail in your infrastructure, right? In the life cycle of this, we started out in earlier versions, running into some of the mistakes that, uh, that Imad was talking about. Uh, the earlier versions of this, we, we had a very large number of VMs to handle the data cache. Uh, and that was, it worked, but it wasn't performant. It had problems. It's a lot to manage. Uh, so using the techniques that Imad was talking about and, and in really looking at what the loads were, the memory usage, and tuning it, in subsequent versions of, of Envision, we got it down. We, we scaled fewer, larger VMs and immediately saw a really you know, noticeable increase in the performance, something that made it capable of handling the sort of load that we really needed to, 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 to give to it. Our latest sort of exploration of this is actually sizing them down. We're playing around with doing some things in the, uh, in the uh, garbage collection to actually put some of the load back on the CPU, just given the, uh, the hardware that we're working with. So this is sort of a, where we're at right now. So this is uh, an example of the JVM tuning, uh, JVM configurations. All right, do you want to jump in? Yeah. So, so uh, just on the previous slide, maybe if you want to go back, just want to make a comment. So I think the first iteration of the Gemfire cluster was 32 JVMs. I can't remember how many VMs there were. I think they played around with 32 VMs. Mm -hmm. And this, you take, take the VM out of the picture anyway, uh, even if you're doing our physical, you know, a cluster of 32 JVM instances as an in-memory fault tolerant cluster is, is just not going to scale, right? And so, you know, just like a speed of light ain't gonna change, distributed engineering fundamentals ain't gonna change, right? So that's, that's what we did there. We went from 32 down to eight JVMs, but obviously the heap size is larger. And then there came the question of, oh, we're not comfortable with like 90 gig JVM, heap size and so on. And so we fixed that problem. So if you go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So the trick we use there is the same trick we use on VROPS up to 6.2, um, which is to use a combination garbage collector, okay? I won't get into JVM tuning, but essentially we're using the concurrent mark and sweep, which is a collector that runs in the old generation side of the Java heap and it doesn't block things, okay? While on the young generation side, so you can kind of split the Java heap into two, old generation and young generation. On the young generation side, we use the parallel collector, and that is actually blocking when it runs, but the way we deal with that blocking is we assign parallel GC threads to it. 
And if you see, uh, where is it? If you see the parallel GC threads, in this case, it's three. That's 50% of the available vCPUs. So that's a six vCPU VM? Mm -hmm. Okay, so 30% of that. And this works really well. Um, the next iteration of this would be probably the G1 garbage collector. So just keep that in mind, take a note of it. I don't expect you guys to know it, but you developers would have heard about it. Um, this is a golden configuration. We've had it for many years. Uh, three, four years ago, this was private to us. We never published it, and then we decided to publish it. But this is kind of the crux of where it allowed everything else to happen because you could understand larger heap spaces are okay. And so what happened in your case was you consolidated down the number of JVMs and VMs. It forced you to go 90 gig, mm -hmm. and that gave you breathing space because performance was okay. Now you said, oh, okay, now let's go down to 32 gig. So consolidate, vertically scale up, give yourself time, and over time, you get back to what you really need. Uh, you can't do those steps all in one full swoop, right? You gotta go through those transitions. And there are architectural considerations as right. well, because uh, yeah, we could take those eight VMs and could turn them into four, but then you're starting to talk about what happens if you lose a node, and how much of your horsepower have you lost in that, in that event. Yeah. So eight seems to be a comfort, seems to fit in a comfortable space. And, and, and just remember, scale up is not free, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. If you can scale up, it's a little bit cheaper and more performant. Keep that in mind. So just the, our experience over the past year, um, especially over the past year, but in general with Ambition, is, is that this is one of those case, uh, cases where uh, silos within the organization make it very difficult to accomplish this sort of thing. You ha we have to be able to work across the silos. I have to be able to work with the developers, what Imad led with, uh, coming from a developer background and working with infrastructure or infrastructure working with developers and having uh, being, being able to work back and forth, understand what each person is talking about and the needs and how that actually relates to what your business is trying to accomplish. Uh, if you get too hidebound, if you're comfortable thinking about, you know, it has to come through chain and I'm, I'm not really interested, I'm just going to provision something and you're going to figure out how to do with it and yell when something is broken, then I'll open the ticket and go and deal with it. You don't get to this kind of, this kind of structure. It's really hard. Uh, and that, of course, helps create multifaceted engineers. You want engineers who have backgrounds and lots of different experience, or at least comfort, some understanding yeah, about I, I multiple technologies. I think this is important because GemFi is actually a data platform. The word platform in it means it's not only software, it needs to aggregate the hardware in a certain way, it's certainly with the example of redundancy zones that we went through. And the industry is moving in that direction where your developers are building out platforms that describe the infrastructure, right? And so it only makes sense for our infrastructure customers to come up and start understanding that knowledge and do some double checking and some sanity checking, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. So I'll stop right there. I want to continue beating on this. <laughs> what we're going to be doing in the next 18 months is we're going to be uh, taking it and abstracting even further, layering VRA uh, automation we've got in private cloud, and we're going to start seeing how this behaves in a hyper-converged space. Uh, just kind of continuing on with the, with the pattern, uh, maintaining w what we're doing and building on it. Uh, the system is mo modular enough that we're also talking about packaging it up for different parts of our company. So you get a you know cache node and a couple of adapters and access to a shared MQ, and then you can just do that for a specific workload, uh, smaller workload. So, and, and I think that is <laughs> right there. So um, we've got some time still for questions. We left some time for you guys to use the mic. Small room, you can yell it out and we could repeat it. You got a question? Yep. No, the, the Gemfire is on VMware on ESXi hosts on HP. Mm -hmm. the, no, they're, they're actually, they're InfiniBand yeah. cards. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you see that, where do you see the contention? Yes, sir. Do you see it on the ESXi side? Do you see it on the side of the VM or SSJVM? Um, it's just similar to the same. Kind of figure out. Do you see the something? But where does it look for? All right. Let me try and repeat that question. 
Uh, I mentioned somewhere in the slide CPU contention because then if you increase the number of JVMs, it trends towards being more CPU bound. That's web apps, category one workloads. And the question is, how do you actually determine that? Where, where do you go monitor and look for? And it turns out there is not a simple answer um, because uh, if I can explain where it can happen, then you could try to look for it. Now, we st I started ESXi. I look at the host. If the host got contention, I know there are way too many JVM instances. And essentially what causes the, well, not always, mostly what causes the CPU contention is the number of garbage collectors. If you assume every JVM instance has got a garbage collector, assuming there are no thread issues or deadlocks within the application, which many applications have, but assuming there aren't, then if I have 80 JVMs running on like a two socket system of eight cores, that host is gonna, is gonna show you know, 80, 90%, 95 CPU spikes. So I start with the ASXi host. If I started the ASXi host and there's nothing, then I move on to the VM level, each individual VM. And then I, uh, you know, I do go through the same monitoring as someone, whether it's vCenter or a bunch of monitoring tools, whatever you're using. And then again, I look, at, I look at the VM and I look at how many JVM instances are there, okay? Uh, I'll do a you know, uh, process dump of how many JVMs there are. I look at the heap space and so on. And then I see how much CPU is being utilized by each JVM. And then finally, I get to, let's say, a JVM that's chewing up all of the CPU. My next stop will be to take a thread dump and you, know, you do kill minus three, whatever you know, of that Java process to find out why it's hugging the CPU. And you could get to a point of automating this. Like whenever, like you can do, uh, you can do synthetic transactions against your application. Like in other words, you can have your load balancer do a login, a fake login, and measure the response time. And if the response time all of a sudden goes 3x, you know you've got a problem you go and take a thread dump against each one of those JVM instances of that specific node, and you collect them. I mean, uh, you don't do that normally on a normal system, but on, a, on an unhealthy system, to get to the point of what's causing it, you would set up that kind of monitoring automation, and I've done that many times in the past. And then we get down to thread dump, and then we look inside the thread dump, we see there's a lock, either it's an application lock, or maybe a garbage collector that's running that's causing it, and, you know, and it gets into the code, basically. I don't know if I answer your question, it's like, there's a three-day answer. <laughs> yeah, so, it's a good question. Yeah, go ahead. You did say book. I wasn't going to say anything about my book. <laughs> uh, I've documented a lot. You guys, uh, I, I do have two books. The second book is obviously more current. I get into a lot of the stuff in there. Um, and vmjava.com is the blog. Uh, this is a whole area of study, right? Um, so you could start there. Start with the book. Start with uh, vmjava.com. Uh, email me or, you know, you could reach out to me. Um, my Twitter alias is at vmjavabook. Um, and what else? ebenjamin at vmware.com. It should be on the slide somewhere. But, um, that's how you can find me. I mean, is that your question? Like, how do you get started on this space? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think, I, let me kind of paraphrase your question. The question is like, I'm on the infrastructure side, and there's all these things running around, all these Java flies running around, right? And I don't know how to control them, right? And so we start with the remote education. We may set up a WebEx. We get both the application side and the infrastructure side. We use you as an infrastructure champion to get us to talk to the application guys. We get you educated on the application side as for you as, as a kind of collateral and weapon to kind of defend yourself for the next root cause analysis. Um, and then if that doesn't work, we would show up on site and do a full on workshop. And you know, depending on the situation, we would ask the developers to be in their room and 
wait for the developers to ask those virtualization 101 questions and deal with them because there's an education gap. You can't address the gap and they can't address the gap. You've got to have somebody who's done both. And we've done that many times and beyond that we move on and it's a better world. I mean, we did or, that at the US. No, right? I mean, he's the customer, right? We kind of went through that three, four years ago and then <laughs> your, your team that manages the trading platform used to be the Linux team but now they have Java runtime experience. They can size the heap size, stop, start, redeploy, tune Gemfire. We have they several understand engineers. enough virtualization. And that's their ops team. That's their DevOps team. Yeah, we had uh, engineers who, who started, and then by the end of the, of the whole run, they were doing something else. They had created a job for themselves and, yeah. uh, around this. And but, any time that we're talking, any time you know, the infrastructure team is worrying about how that power CLI script works and, and uh, whether or not the DHCP is working fine, so when we deploy the VM, it does what it needs to do. But whenever we start talking about the actual configuration of the VM, what it's actually there to do, those conversations immediately start involving multiple teams. It's frequently three people in a room with maybe somebody like Imad, yeah. frequently Imad, uh, you know, uh, providing, uh, mm -hmm. sort of brokering the conversation so that we're all speaking the same language. And that's, that's what I call the renaissance of platform engineer. That's that new team of new way of cross-sectional thinking. That's your platform engineering team. If it's not there, start thinking about creating it. That step is personality driven too. That step yeah. is finding that, that, that one person on the other team who you can work with, who listens to you, who you know, who, who, yeah. who pays attention, and you can we, we, establish we are, your table. Right, we are at an age where you can't just silo yourself into a load balancer person, web server, and so on. You need to find those people that are comfortable to actually chase a problem across all the tiers. And uh, you're not going to know everything, right? As long as you can reach out to the certain people to kind of put the picture together. But this is happening. It's happening in the industry, and platform engineering is, is the way of the future. Any uh, questions? Looks like I know. Good time. Thank you. Thank you oh, there much. was a question. Ooh, already sold. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Well, I mean, I mean, so optimizing, the, the question is, you talked about NUMA optimization, which is kind of a CPU and memory compute space optimization. Have you looked at the networking side of things? Obviously, I, I chase a problem where it presents itself. So if there's drop packets or anything like that, then we go look at to see if there's jumbo frames being set up or not, take advantage of that. If there's a latency issue, we look at uh, disabling interrupt coalescing, both on the physical link, the virtual link, on both sides of the link, and things like that. Um, TCP window sizing on the operating system. Uh, I've talked about that in, the, in, in my book and so on. But I, I caution that just do that only when you need it. Don't, don't go, yeah, if it ain't broke, kind of don't, don't fix it. So. Sure. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Have you actually had to do that or have you just had to investigate if it's necessary? I've done both. So there have been cases. I mean, especially if you're dealing with uh, IP based storage or anything like that, if you're doing a kind of, let's say, like a, a Hadoop cluster that can drive a lot across the network, we've had to do that. And nothing to do with virtualization again, you know. Uh, it, you would be doing the same thing on a physical system. It's distributed competing one-on-one. -on -one. All right, guys. Thank you. Please fill out the survey. <laughs>